First Peter, continuing in chapter 3, is where we're going to pick our text up this morning. <clears throat> As I've been in study and just, just spending time in, in the Word, there's one thing that still comes to my mind more and more, seems like more and more is more than it used to, thankfully, is to to further to further cement or to further uh, ingrain the the offering that Christ made. Just what he done for us. And I know we can say, oh, well, I know what he's done for us. But we, we never really fully grasp the fullness of it. It's, it's, it's awesome to look into it, to study it, to have a, to have a revelation in your, in your heart as God begins to exp expound upon it and show us by his spirit. And to know that that need is there for us to, to have that working in our life. And that's, that's just, I just want to say those words as we go into this this morning because this everything concerning we as children of God and this walk that we have in this life, this life that we now live, we know the scripture says that we are to live it by the faith of the Son of God, this life that I now live in the flesh, as Paul wrote. And that we are not, you know, we're not limited whenever it comes into that, but only by how we press into that, only on how we apply that, only on how that we expose ourselves to more of Him, more of His Spirit, more of His power working in us, and that it only that we must never forget that it only can come. This can only come by a continual faith in that sacrifice, in that blood that was shed, in the, the price that was paid for us at Calvary. That's the only way we're going to grow in this. That's the only way we're going to mature into sons of God that he's called us to be. He's called us to be this. So everything that we do and everything that we involve and everything that we, we apply ourselves in this life, it should be into for His glory. It should be for His purpose. That He be glorified in every part and partial of our life. And that we don't Im, Im, you know, try to imitate others, but we look unto Christ. We have Him as an example. And we know that we are to walk as he walked on this earth, but by the power of the Spirit working within us. And it's about the revelation that God wants to use, wants to pour out to use us to be instruments in his hand. We've been studying in Acts, and this past Wednesday night, it was some things that just kind of stood out to me a little bit. But there was a time that these signs and wonders begin to be strongly manifested in Paul's ministry. See, we don't, it's as the Spirit wills, as the Spirit moves, and as the Spirit uses individuals who will surrender their life to Him. So don't, don't get confounded and discouraged and, you know, if, so we're not seeing signs and wonders like we want to see. Just keep wanting to see them. Just keep wanting to be the one that God uses in those areas. Have faith in, in understanding that, that it's, this is as the Spirit wills, as God wills and intends. We have to apply ourselves, of course. We have to take the initiative. We have to continue by faith, do the things that you know, he is instructed for us to do, to be faithful, to present ourselves, to continue to, you know, allow him to have the preeminence, the, 
you know, number one spot in our heart. And I believe through this we'll see more and more and more of the things of the Spirit of God at work in our life. It's, it's, we should be perfectly, you know, comfortable believing God for somebody to be completely healed from a, paral a, a paralysis condition. I probably messed that up on how I said it. A paralysis. Par okay. Yes. Thank you, Brother Roger. That's, we should be perfectly comfortable with believing God that he's able to do that. And trusting and believing God, even as a church, would make prayer that it would be done. Yes, sir. Even as, you know, when Jesus spoke the word, he said, you know, the centurion said, but speak the word only. To have faith to believe in that and to expect God to move. Because I believe we are in those days. We can see the hand of God moving and to expect him to move and do things that really we see in the book of Acts many times. I said all that because as I begin reading this, I want us to always focus and our, our, our main focus and objective be on why Christ came. Why did he come to this planet? Why did God send his only begotten son? This is, I asked that question before I begin reading. I want to I read this, and I'm going to go back into verse 18, and we're going to read on a little bit. There is, I spent some time on some of these things studying, and I, I'm not going to be able to cover all of it. I'm just going to tell you that straight out, but I only want to try to impart to you what I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to say. But I encourage you as hearers and believers in God's Word to study, to find you some good resource material and study to see what the Word of God says. Don't just trust and, and, and just try to live off of what others are, are, are telling us all the time. We need to study. We need to take time to, to look into and study for ourselves. Now, let's read verse 18. Verse 18, chapter 3 of 1 Peter. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. I want to read verse 1 of chapter 4. And then I'm going to expound to you some things that I feel the Holy Spirit wants to say. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Going back, looking to remember that in verse 18, I want to point out a couple of points here that he might bring us to God. He has suffered for sins. Christ has suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. He was the propitiation that God had, 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 had given mankind. Think of, think, of the, think of the moment here whenever Christ was sent. It said in the fullness of time, when the time was, was when, God, when it was time, Christ came. 
and the length of time that it took for him to come. You see, this, this whole, this is so much bigger than what we realize at many times. This plan that God has had from before the foundation of the world. It is so much larger and so much greater than what we, you know, give credit to it sometimes. We, of course, we can't get, you know, consumed by that. We're not supposed to give, you know, our, ourselves to trying to figure out, I mean, this is God's plan. He, we have the, 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 the rudiments of it. We have the elementary parts of it, and we can grow in it. We can, can build in it. But what God had planned from the beginning of time, from before the earth was ever, you know, formed, that we need to understand that he's the same God then, and he's the same God now. And that what he has planned is going to come to pass. Everything God has planned, everything God has said, it shall be done. It shall come to pass. Now, this, this verse also brings out the point that he was put to death in the flesh. He, he, as a, he became flesh. He dwelt among us. And he, was, and he gave his life as a ransom. He gave himself that he would be an offering for sin. And that this is critical for us to understand this. He didn't die spiritually. He died in his flesh. But when he died in his flesh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was quickened in the spirit that he went into this place a place in the Greek word that is named Tartarus it is a, it is a place that God placed the disobedient angels that he went and he presented himself unto these spirits this word spirits here is never to be referred to as men. Men are not spirits. They have spirits. They're never referred to as spirits. But angels are spirits. And when Jesus gave his life, when he was crucified on the cross, he paid that price. The price was paid here in this text in verse 19 it, it, it bears out some truth to us that during this time we know that he went into the lower parts of the earth we know that he went there for a purpose he didn't go there to suffer his suffering was over he suffered while he was on this earth you can read in Psalm 22 and I encourage you to do that and read Isaiah 53, of the suffering servant, to, to, to read of his sufferings. But when he left this earth and he went down into the lower parts of this earth, he went there on a mission. He went there and he released all the Old Testament saints that had died prior to that that were still held because Satan had a legal right to hold them until the price was paid. Now, we don't really understand sometimes all that Jesus did. We don't really understand sometimes all that, what the blood bought. I'm, talk, I'm talking about freedom here. I'm talking about victory here. I'm talking about when he went and he led captivity captive, the scripture says. He brought them out and he brought them unto the Father. He's the one that escorted them personally unto the Father. Now, this right here, this, like I said, this is just one verse of Scripture. And we have to study these things out. It says that by which he went by the anointing, he went by the Spirit, he went and he preached, he said, unto these spirits in prison. This word preached is not what I'm doing right now. But he went and he made an announcement. That's right. as, a, as, a, as one, as a public crier out on the streets, 
as one that would go in and make a, a, a life-changing, important announcement. But that he went and he announced that, hey, what you thought you was going to do didn't work. What you intended that you and, and your boss thought y'all were going to do in thwarting the plan of God, it didn't work and it ain't going to work. Here I am. The price is paid. And I've come down here to tell you. I've come down here to show myself to you. I've come down here to say that you're going to stay, you're going to stay in here until the great white throne judgment. You, going to, you know that they're still there today. That place is still filled with those angels that left their first estate. In Jude chapter 1, we'll go there maybe in a, in a minute. I think it's in verse 6 and 7 that, that correlates with this. We will go there, Lord, if I don't run out of time. But Verse 20 says, But which sometime were disobedient. Now, we know the scripture says that, I think I'm correct on this, that approximately a third of the angels went into rebellion with, was then Lucifer, now Satan, when they rebelled against God. Now of this third of the angels that were created, there's, scripture bears out, you know, that this number is innumerable, amount of angels that God created. And he created them for a purpose. He created them to do what they're supposed to do. But they became disobedient. And this was not just talking about those who originally rebelled with Satan. But they, it says they were sometimes disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. A lot, a lot here to be understood correctly. Because there's a lot of, many times, false doctrine comes from scriptures like this. People don't, they don't, haven't rightly divided the word of truth. First of all, we need to understand that you can go back to Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to do that before I go any further. Go with me to Genesis chapter 6. And it tells us exactly what took, what took place during this time. I just, I, I just love to, to study and, and, and to to see how the Word of God, it, it never contradicts itself. It's always there to teach us and to, to really, it's, it's available to everybody. And that's, ain't that amazing? We have that opportunity to study, to read. It says, beginning in verse 1 of Genesis 6, it said, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that were very fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also was flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, this is still, I think, to be debated, but actually what the scripture was bearing out, I believe that he was talking about the man the man Adam, just through study, because he says that he is also flesh, that, that Adam was flesh. He was, of course, he was a man. He was a flesh and blood man. The very next verse says, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that meaning that before the flood and after the flood, giants were on the earth. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, they became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. This, this one thing people's tried to, 
explain this away. And, but the truth is that this is speaking of the angels that became disobedient during this time of while the ark was a preparing. Satan had a plan to try to completely annihilate and do away with the pure Adamite stock, according to Finnis Dake. That's what he referred to it as, the, the pure Adamite stock that God originally created. And Satan's plan was, was to mingle that where it wasn't pure, where it wasn't what God had created. And his, his plan was, was because you can go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he was told that even though you're going to bruise his heel, the seed of the woman shall bruise your head. And that prophecy was given to the serpent, given to Satan through the serpent, that which he, you know, he used that creature in the garden. And he had a plan that, well, we're going we're gonna to change God's plan. So there were, and, this, and people have trouble with this, cause, and, but if you study it out, you'll begin to see that all this does make sense. That in Jude, I'm going to go there in just a minute, it says that they, they left their first estate, they left their, the habitation, the bounds of their habitation. They, they left and they took on the form of men on this earth. It's, it's not unusual to know, even the scripture says, that many have entertained angels unawares. In Hebrews it tells us that. You may have met someone that you look back and says, you know, I, I believe that was an angel. I don't know so much if today if an angel would always be a certain person, male or female. I don't know that. But I do know and believe that, that they were all created as evidence in the Scripture as to resemble man, not the, the female gender, but the male gender. There's no baby angels, and there's no women, uh, well, I guess I could say that right, women angels that the Scripture bears out. I'm pretty sure of that. Y'all study it. Please go back and check, make sure I'm telling you right. Now, they don't procreate, did they? No, sir. They were not given that power to procreate. There was no need for them. They were created to, you know, they were eternal beings, supernatural beings. Procreation was only given unto mankind. And that's why God created the woman and, and brought her unto Adam to procreate the human species. But here we see evidence that the angels took on a different form. They left their first estate, their first habitation. I'm going to get there in just a minute in Jude, but I got something else in Genesis I got I to gotta show you. It said that Noah, it, well, let me, let me read this scripture here. It said that God saw, this is verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination and thoughts of his heart was evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. I will destroy, he said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. He said that he would destroy every thing that had the, that had the breath of life. Every man, every woman, every child, every creature, everything would be destroyed. You know, the animal kingdom was created for man. And, you know, when man's, uh, I guess man's failures affects the animal kingdom as well. 
and they suffer for it. I don't want to get bogged down in that too much, but anyway, that's why whenever God instructed them after the flood, the same, you know, Satan knew that God promised he would never again flood the earth and destroy all of life. But the plan continued after the flood. We don't know in detail how long or how much, but the giants were here as well again. And we have no reason to believe that they weren't, they had to be produced the same way they were before. And I said this because a lot of people don't understand why did he instruct those who were going in to the promised land to destroy every man, every woman, every child, and every animal? Why would God want to do that? Because that sin, of course, sin, we can always look and point to sin, but because, you know, the, the human race had become polluted again. The, the, it was, was not, the pureness was not there that God intended in the human race. Jesus had not yet been born to the Virgin Mary. And God had to preserve that lineage. He had to preserve that purity. So we look at things like that and if we're not careful, we'll, we'll wonder, you know, you know, this is the God I serve. You know, he's holy, church. He hates sin. And I look at that and I said, you know, God, I know you hate sin, but how much more do you really hate it in my life, in the life of any of your children that, that call upon your name? So that, church, that's an encouragement to us to, to keep our hearts open before the Lord, to keep our hearts soft, to, to always know that God wants to change us. And, and we get to thinking we've got it all together. You know, we've got so far to go. God wants to use us. He wants to change us. He wants to con continue to get sin out of our hearts and out of our life. The, the habits that we may see, well, it's not bothering anybody. What about God? What about how we're presenting him before others? Do we do that to just blend in with our surroundings? And, or do we just try to be that example that God's called us to be? To walk in his holiness. It's, it's not our holiness, it's his holiness. And all this was, is, it gives us a view and a picture. Yes, we can look at Christ. We can look at him coming and suffering and dying on the cross. And we can see the, the, the terribleness of sin. And we should do that. We should always remember that. That it's, it's sin that God hates it. He hates it. He's, he's provided the way for us that we don't have to live under it. We don't have to live in its bondages and its the chains that, that want to keep us bound. The things that would limit us and you know, enable us that we're, we're not an effective witness for him any longer. It separates us between man and God, sin. It says, but Noah, the next verse said that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. That word right there, it does not mean he was sinlessly perfect, perfect in his generations, but it simply means that he, is, he was still from pure Adamite stock. His lineage was still pure. But you, I don't know how many people was on the earth during that time. I bet it was a good, pretty good, goodly number, but you realize that only eight people, that only eight souls were aboard the ark. Think about that. Think about that and remember that how easily sin and how rapidly sin spreads and how it destroys. And though they, they tried, I'm sure they tried to fashion themselves boats 
and rafts and says, I know where there is a tree that is taller than any tree and it's on top of a hill. And I know that water's not going to get that high. I bet that treetop was full of folks because they thought there was another way of escape. They thought there was another way to escape the judgment of God. But they didn't make it. Yeah, they had their youngins or their babies with them. They was trying, you know, but it was too late. The judgment of God, the wrath of God was being poured out on this earth. It's coming again, church. Amen. Not the flood, but his judgment, his wrath is going to be poured out again. And God has made a way. The ark has been prepared. And he's still asking today, come into the ark. So, I told you I was going to Jude. I'm going to have to do it, then i got to move on. It says in, in <clears throat> I put you, I'm going to begin in verse 5 of Jude. It says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt. So stop and think for just a minute. And remember how God brought his people out. Miraculous power of God, wasn't it? How that he saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So he's putting us in remembrance of this. Verse number six, it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That's when they're going to get released. But they're not going to get a pardon. They're going to get a one-way ticket to the lake of fire. That's where they'll continue to reside forever and ever. So that tells us, but the next verse confirms which particular angels these are talking about. I'm going to read in verse 7. It says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as a what? An example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So he's, he's using the, the men of Sodom, those that, you know, went men unto men and women unto women. They, they chose to do this. They, they gave themselves over to fornication. But verse 8 ties it all back together. He says, likewise. Likewise. These, it's, it's the same thought pattern. Exactly as we see here that this is the group of angels mentioned before the flood and after the flood that came unto the daughters of men to try to thwart the plan of God to keep the Redeemer, to keep the Son of God from being born, to come and do what He came to do. That's what it's all about, is what He came to do, and that He came to do it, and He done it. And that we're to live unto Him into that. Every day that we're not to, you know, to, to, to be that, He says that we walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we're called. To be a child of God, that's a high calling, church. We're not supposed to be like this world. We're not supposed to be like just everybody else that we run into. We're supposed to be like Him. And that should be our, our desire. That should be our thought pattern, our process continually to be more like Him, to be more like Jesus. He's, he's given that example to us. He's the one that we look to. He's the one that has, that has made the way. And it's, it's not any other way that we're to look to. He's provided that plan. Now, I want to go back to 1 Peter. It says that few, that, I'm more, this is the last part of verse 20, that few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, Peter, the Holy Spirit had Peter put these words down. He didn't make a mistake. But you know, the water is not really what saved them. It was the ark 
that saved them, that preserved them, that spared them the judgment. Okay? That's very important that we understand that. Because he says the very next verse, the like figure, in the same manner, the like figure were into even baptism doth also now save us. Stop right there just for a minute. Word of God never contradicts itself. First of all, we are to understand that we are spiritually baptized into Christ the moment we believe upon Him for salvation. That God places us into the death of His Son. He, in the mind of God, were placed there. We were put there. I would say only God can do this. But it, here Peter says, that we know now even that baptism does also now save us. Now, church, you cannot in no way take and use this scripture to build a doctrine, to try to come in and say that you're not saved until you're water baptized. That is, that is wrong. That is wrong. That is an evidence that we demonstrate, that we you know, engage ourselves in, we initiate that, and we say, you know, I feel like I need to be baptized. But it's never for your salvation. But it's simply as an example to show what has already done took place in the believer's heart. So when you come across things like that, you don't just say, well, you know, this is okay. Well, this is something God added to it. No, never. But when we properly understand it, we see that this is part. He says, because then he says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. You know, that doesn't mean that you need a bath and you're going to go get baptized to take a bath. That's not what he means. You might read that and think that's what it means because, you know, it's, uh, soap and bath water is good. Hot showers, whatever you like to take. They're good. They're needed. And I'm thankful that we have those in this country pretty readily available. Amen? Yeah, go ahead. The word uh, in the Greek there is an antitype. Talking about baptism. He's given the example right. of baptism. Baptism is the exact opposite of getting saved. Yes. It's the result of being saved. Yes. That's what the Greek word brings out. Uh, me and Sister Francis were talking about that the other day. It's the answer of a good conscience. In other words, exactly. That's my conscience is clear <clears throat> now. I know I'm right with God. Right. So now I can be baptized. Right. You know what I'm saying? Well, look at what Philip told the eunuch. You can be baptized. Yes. If you believe with all of your heart. Yes. You know what I'm saying? I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He goes and gets baptized. You know, and I think that was the most beautiful revelation. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I, I think I read it in the, the New King James Version is, uh, is what brought out the antitype, which helps us understand it greatly. For me, it even, yeah. I had always had a question about right, the scripture. Right, right. And, and, and most time people do. You know, they, they just can't quite put it together. So thank you for bringing that out because it, it is about having that clear conscience unto God. That's why it's not about just making your flesh clean, but he says the filth of the flesh. The filth of, a, of a, you know, if people are unregenerate, if they're unregenerated, if they're lost, they're filthy. Their mind is filthy. And, you know, and that's what God comes to save us from, not in it, but from it, to pull us out of that mindset, that we be renewed in the spirit of our mind. That we don't have the same mindset that we had before. Right. We're different. We're automatically smarter. Whenever, you, whenever you're born again, you're, I'm, I've, I really believe that you could probably do a study and people are automatically smarter when they come to God. And we have something, God has something he can work with now. Amen. He wants to build us and grow us up. But we are to present ourselves and we, we, we give ourselves to that, that we're renewed in the spirit of our mind. And it's, it's, it's a daily thing. It has to continue to go on, on and on and on. We don't do it one time. It's continual. It's continual flow, continual renewing of the mind. 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to end in verse 22. He says, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Where's Jesus at today? We, we know he's at the right hand of God. The scripture says that. In bodily form, that's where he's at. By his spirit, of course, he's in me. He's in you. He's in, still in this earth. But his, in his body, his, his flesh and bone body is at the right hand of God. Because his blood has already been given. Amen. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto who? Him. Unto him. Think about that, church. The name of Jesus. We, you and I as children of God, we have that that privilege to use the name of Jesus. We have that, you know, God-given right to use the name of Jesus. Everything that we do to do it all in the name of Jesus. Because it's that name, it's unto him that everything has been made subject because he came and he fulfilled the plan of God. He came, he done the work, and now we can get the benefits. Amen? Thank y'all. Thank you for your attention and your participation and God bless you. And just believe God for a miracle. Amen. Praise God.